Good morning, Roger. Um, glad to hear you're doing a great job at uh, Miami. At first, I was like, oh, he's going to go to Miami. Maybe it'd be great for him to take it, the time off. Because um, I expected that he would skip this tournament like last year. But um, I'm glad, you know, you're doing very well down there and seem happy. And obviously, clearly, it's a good decision, of course. Um, so that that's great. I, I think I want to get to... The point of my video today is revisiting a little bit of what was in the last video, which is dealing with, um, you know, that last bit of contradiction. Um, you know, it's on the one hand, you're working really, really hard. Um, and then on the other hand, I feel like I said in my last video that you're at this point where you can absolutely, you're on the threshold of of graduating and being, you know, in the top and being a, a, a forerunner, you know, very easily in the top. But it's like, I believe that on some level, you know, on some big level, again, it's like, what does it mean to be on the threshold to be the absolute top again? It's like, oh, you know, these constant articles and constant hype on the buildup between the rivalry between either Rafa and you or Djokovic and you. And, oh, my God, what if they beat you? Then it'll be like, oh, my God, Roger Federer, you know, couldn't do this and couldn't do that. And, again, I think if you just really get clear, and I think you're clear on this part, where do you want to be? You clearly want to be at the top because you started working yourself up. You could have you could have retired. You could have given in the towel, you, uh, thrown in the towel. You could have quit. You could have melted under everything, you know, or, or any kind of disappointment that's happened even within the last five years, you know. Um, you know, you weren't like Bjorn Borg, who I believe quit while he was at the top. You know, it's like, oh, I'm number one. Oop, let me quit, you know. And I'm not saying that he's a quitter, but that was his decision. So um, it also takes a lot of strength to go on, you know, and um, you are an amazingly strong person, you know. I mean, just the media alone murders some athletes. People, people get murdered, you know, in, in the media and never recover psychologically from those things. So, you know, clearly... You know, I want to acknowledge that side of you. You have a lot of strength, a, a great, great, great amount of strength to do all of this on a world platform again, as you know, I always say. So, um, you know, you built yourself back up. You've pulled yourself back up. And, um, you know, I don't want to say it doesn't take much because I would be dismissing all of the hard work that you do. You've always been a hard worker, but... You know, you always end up in the top three at the least. And I feel that even not being in your highest gear, you you can attain the top third spot. And, you know, even in the past, not fully being in your highest gear, you have been in the top three and in the top two. And now, look, you're almost, you're really going to end up in the top three. You probably in the next couple of weeks end up at number three. I think you know that. I know that. I think we all pretty much know you know, at least by the end of May, that you will probably be in the top, you will be the number three player in the world. Um, so that brings up some things again, like, once again, you know, you have, you have the ability physically, um, you're doing very well now, you've already propelled yourself from number eight in the world to number five. You know, and I don't want to say that was easy. Maybe it would seem like a disservice to you if I'm like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> but in any case, you are at number five, almost ready to go to number four. And then just about 100, maybe 200 points away from number three in the world. So, again, you know, now we have this thing where the reality of who Roger Federer is, is being realized, um, actualized in this reality of ours, you know? So we have all these other, we have this other false reality that people create in the media and all these questions and things like that, but people are not doing that. The media is, the tone of the media isn't that so much anymore with you. Everyone is just really acknowledging how well you're doing. The thing is, is that you're at the threshold now when you really can do this, you really could really beat these guys, you know? 
I've always said that to you. You can be Joker. You know you can be Joker, you know. And I love Joker and all of that, but I'm just saying, at the end of the day, you're a better player, you know. Um, you could definitely be Rafa. You just haven't been able to get over that, that hurdle too, too much. I mean, you've beaten him a bit in the past, but you need to get more consistent with it. Rafa knows you could beat him. Uncle Tony knows you could beat Rafa. Uncle Tony knows you're a better player than Rafa is. Rafa knows you're a better player than he is. Not to take anything away from Rafa um, because he's excellent in his own right. And I think a lot of it just comes, a lot of his steam. Well, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away his steam because I, I do believe, I was about to say that a lot of Rafa's steam comes from you, which I do believe is true, but I don't believe 100% of his, um, all of his motivation because he, he's just naturally motivated. So I don't want to take that away from him. And he's just, you know, naturally It'd be stupid for anybody to dispute that he's not he's not the hardest grinder in the game. Like he grinds, he works, he works, you know. I mean he he's he grinds. So anyway, um but it's just there's something natural with him. Just like you're the most elegant player, you're the to me the best all around player. I mean, you know, you create these most amazing shots. I mean, that's you. That's how you handle yourself on the court. And Djokovic is, is resilient, probably one of the most, like I said in the last video, one of the most res just resilient people probably in the entire game. Um, you know, and uh, in any case, um, I, I've made this video because... <laughs> because um, I saw a fan who was triggered by your your video in Indian Wells after the final with Djokovic, and um, uh, he said something, he made something simple, he was upset about the outcome of the match, the final, and he made a comment, which was valid, you know, in all truth, it was valid, and I mean, so many fans like jumped all over him, so many Federer fans, it was weird, but I was, you know, and he's, English is not his first language, he made one little mistake in English, and they were like jumping all over him. Now, I can see correcting the man if a man was like responding and saying something smart to you, but he was just making a general comment, minding his business, just reacting to the video, and people are like attacking his English, so I thought that was kind of lame, but anyway, so, um, on and on, back and forth, he goes with like 30 to 40 people <laughs> talking to him. And uh, he's a pretty strong guy, so, so that was good for him. He can handle it. But then he goes, I really don't get it, Roger. I'm going to read it exactly the way he wrote it. Um, like I said, English is not his first language. He goes, I really don't get it, Roger. Why are you making them gifts like in a match? that was yours from the beginning. I am sorry, but I am way pissed off to see your videos right now. He's talking about your um, post-commentary interview. Um, yeah, uh, way pissed off to see your videos right now and your excuses. It seems to me that you don't give a shit after reaching the tie break and shitting all over it after all the hard work that you did. I added that part in. The only thing you need to get stronger mentally, that's pretty much all. What he was saying throughout the, um, you know, I hope that doesn't sound too harsh. I just figured out, oh my goodness, I just read something that might be so harsh. But I've been harsh in my videos too, so I can't really say. Then, uh, anyway, let me go further down. He says something like some other fans, like 10, 15 fans jumping all over him, sticking up for you, arguing for the fact arguing for that performance in the third in the tie break um somebody was saying something about Nole doing great and as far as resilience is concerned sure Djokovic did a great job but in my opinion there's no reason you shouldn't have run that match you know I love you and I'm not here to attack you but I'm just putting this stuff out here so you can really see, not to confuse any of this as an attack, but to confuse, not, I mean, not, yeah, not to confuse any of it as an attack, but to get clear that people see a potential that maybe, you know, you are not fully, you're not fully doing what you are supposed to do, not in that moment, not in that match, you know, and I know that you have been through a lot mentally. Um, I know that you've been through a lot, you've been through stuff that none of us as fans will ever know probably um but at the same time it's like you're at the point again at 
the point where you're at the threshold where you have the fork in the road is now. You can either go this way where you decide, you know, you want to half step mentally and give over matches to, jo to Djokovic who was already mentally shot and was just playing point by point, holding on by thread. You know, not to take anything from Joker because, like I said, he can rely on his resilience very well. Um, the other, the other, the other part of the road is you can commit fully to just being the best player that you can be ever. Un. unbridled effort and choose this path that you are, you are working you know you are on the court grinding it out with your coach Severin and with your mentor that's what you call um, Stefan now you, I mean, what are the question is again? This fan is bringing up is really good. It's like, you know, it's time a little bit for the reality check. Everything's coming together. You made the racket change. You did this. You did that. You did whatever you need to do with your back. You're doing all these new exercises. You're committing to that. You're doing the serving. You're committing to keeping keeping the joints. You know, I think you said something like, you know, just keeping it oiled, which is is right. You know, you're just keeping keeping that joint oiled. You know, practicing your serve. You're doing all this, but for what? So you can get to the moment where you can be Djokovic for a second time, and you're at that fork in the road, and you decide not to take it. What's all the work for? So that's why I think like you're coming to the point where you're facing your own demon and your own self, and people are seeing it, and it's okay because we have all our own damn demons as well. You know what I mean? So it's not to say that we are um, judging you as if we don't have some of these same issues and my god you know i wish i had you know somebody to just check me on my bullshit sometimes you know what i mean i mean i had one person a couple months ago but that's another story like this person was like gia la 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 la, la. He, you know it was really funny and i really kind of appreciated that man i was like this is like the first time somebody's ever really checked me on my bullshit and i mean i didn't real. you don't realize it you don't realize what you're doing you know, you're you're working hard and on one aspect and then you're kinda like, you know, you've got the you're creating the hole in the bowl, you got the window open, letting the heat out, you know what I mean? Like those type of things. You're like throwing effort out the window, but you're doing all this stuff over here. You know, so I just say you have you're at the fork in the road. Congratulations. You're doing so well. You really, as far as effort is concerned, you have made the commitment and decided that you really want to be the best. Now, you're coming to face yourself, your own demon, so to speak. And it's either you're going to let that entity drive, be in the driver's seat or you're going to move it out and decide, hey, it's safe for me to fully commit to this and fully be out there and fully express the fire that I have in my belly and just get out there and, and play every match. Like Ellen Iverson says, you know, a basketball player, um, play every match like it's my last and just do what I have to do. And if I lose to, you know, if I lose to Djokovic, you know, or whatever, and whatever the hell the media has to say, I'm still going to define myself. Because, Roger, I don't think you realize you've been defining yourself. And do you realize because you've been defining yourself and, kept, and because you keep saying the best tennis is around the corner for me, that the tone in the media has changed? Now, I addressed some of this in my last video to you. Um, and I said... You know, it, it takes it takes two people to really take on the energy of a situation. The media can say whatever the hell they want to say over the last couple of years. Oh, Roger has lost it. Oh, Roger is this. Oh, Roger might be having to be retired. Blah, 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 blah. Look at all that shit was wrong, you know? And I'm sorry to say it like that, but 
I'm just saying, people are asking you to retire when you were number three in the world. And that's almost some of the reason why I had to start making these videos. Because I'm just like, the rationale was just stupid. The lack of critical thinking was stupid. And the lack of your belief and the misinterpretation, um, the gross misinterpretation and um, deduction, I guess you could say, on what your or deduce, deducement, I'm not even exactly sure enough, English is my first language right now, um, people were, did, you know, their, their skills of deduction were just, just terrible, um, you know, they're, they just, they, you know, they're telling you to retire, you're number three in the world, and then you went to number two, and then you went to number one in the same year, I mean, you know, so now you're at this point, again, where you're going to confront the rivalry with Rafa, the rivalry with Djokovic, um, some rivalry with other other players. And now, I mean, what you have nothing to lose. You know, you never did. You only have to gain, you know. And I think what you're realizing now is that you can win when you fully commit. When you fully commit to being free of inhibition, to being free on the court, to tr absolutely trusting yourself, following through. And you can see it. You can really see it in the last couple of months when you are on the court absolutely trusting yourself. And it is so beautiful. It is so inspiring. And I think it's a little bit cheap. Like maybe people push you because you inspire so many people and it's almost like cheap inspiration. I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm just coming along with another conversation right now. But, um, you know, it's, it's really beautiful. So you're able to, to really beat these guys. You, if you really, you're, you're at the fork in the road, you're ready to cross the threshold. Either you go right or left. This is your left and this is your right. This is my right. But, you know, um, either you go and you choose to really allow yourself to excel on the platform that you know you can that the data has given you so far even in these few months that you can do this you know um it's just you're in your own way you know a little bit um you're not in your own way as far as really have decided to commit to getting a new racket doing all the stuff that i mentioned all the good stuff that i mentioned but now you're in your own way um whereas you beat Djokovic at one point you know, when the odds are stacked against you, you're, like, really working. But once you're up at the top of the hill a little bit, ready to be on top, you know, not to say that you have an easy job at doing any of this stuff, but you're not comfortable there. So you've got to get comfortable with being there, with leading, with, you know, with beating Rafa, with beating Djokovic, with being in those rivalries that people will cook up and all, all of those things that they'll build up around you. I mean, you're there, you're on the world platform, so you got to get clear on what you really want. And you do want it, because you've been working for it, so you want it. But now you need to work out this final kink, you know? And I think the way to do that is to just simply commit to yourself that no matter what, I'm out there just doing my best. I may be Rafa this day, I may be Rafa next month, I may be Djokovic this day, I may be Djokovic next month. Hell! You know, if, you know, I'm just staying in my own lane and I'm focused on being the best player that I can be. And I'm okay with being at the top, you know? And even if being at the top is one day at the top and then one day, you know, here. And then I'm just going to keep working to get to the top. So I say just committing to do your best. Like, just make that your only freaking thing. And I think that you will be able, if you just turn your entire focus and commitment to that, just doing your absolute best, just doing your absolute best in every single moment as much as, as, much as you can in every single moment possible, the wins will come as a byproduct. And if you just do your absolute best in committing to every match that might not go your way, trying to make it, you know, trying to figure out which new ways you can improve, that sh is what should be your focus at this point in your career as far as I'm concerned because anything else is going to keep you in uh, suspension. You know, I really do truly believe 
again, that the possibility for you to be a top and start a new, you know, the media will start a new rivalry thing and all these stories and all this speculation and all these conversations because that's what they do because they have to sell newspapers and they have to keep people interested. So they, they create rivalries. They love it. It sells. You know, that's their story. That is not your story. What you need to do is get comfortable with being your best in every single moment and trying to beat anyone who's standing in front of you and make the changes and that's it. Just commit to that and I think you'll be much more comfortable on the court. So having said all of that, um, yeah, and if you could just let go, just let go of everything else. Like none of anything else is define you. When like look at the player you are now. Maybe you're not winning every single every single final, but people are so happy you're playing beautiful tennis. First of all, you're doing so well. Everyone in the in the Federer camp world, Federer fandom is so happy. I mean, uh, on these boards, they love what you're doing, and they know it's it, they feel like. You know, again, your best tennis is right on the horizon, and like even more tennis. And I, I don't think it, it, even if you see, like, get a feel for what some of these fans are thinking, the last horizon really is a mental, mental aspect. You know, it's not even you physically or anything like that. And even today, I said, uh, I saw someone say, oh, most of Roger's um, hot shots are coming off the backhand. Like, he's generating, all, he's generating even more top soon off his backhand. Like, it's excellent. Like, people, fans are really excited. You know, we're really behind you. We know what you can do. And at the same time, we know what you've been through. So I just want to send you so much love, you know, and just if you could just see what your real potential was, you know, and and, and allow it to, ex, you know, express itself in its full form, you're going to be winning so much and you're going to be so much more happy with yourself rather than half stepping and playing and giving gifts to, to Novak. And I know, you know, that might really piss you off or rub you the wrong way, and I really don't mean it in that way, but I think it, even if it wasn't on a conscious level, Roger, it definitely was on an unconscious level. Um, again, there was no reason for you to lose that match at Indian Wells, okay? Especially since, Ra I mean, uh, Rafa. Um, Nole was, like, totally out of sorts mentally himself. Like, he's going through his own thing, you know, but... Why don't you utilize that to really see you're not the only person who goes through this. You know, when you get out of your own game and out of your own head and mentally pulled into the media, you know, and I think he, poor Novak is probably taking all of this stuff a little personally. He's lost himself a bit. It's, it, you know, he'll pull himself together eventually. Watch out next year. You know what I mean? He'll get tired of losing. His feet will hit the very bottom because once you hit that bottom... You know, I'm not saying this in a disrespectful way, and I'm saying this personally, for personal experience. Once your feet hit that bottom, I mean, there's just nowhere else to go but back up. And I think that you could say that you probably experienced the same thing. Like, you know, you go through this whole thing where you're down on yourself, you're feeling down on yourself, and then you're losing matches you shouldn't be losing. And the media is saying you need to be doing this and quit and this and that and a third. And then you're winning stuff and still performing well in certain ways. And, you know... It begins, the reality begins to sort of sort itself out from the lies, from the misconceptions, from the confusion, from the noise, you know, and then you really get to see who you are. So I believe that, you know, Novak will be probably, if he doesn't get himself back together later this season, he'll be back on next year, you know, by the Australian Open, I think. You know, it takes that route. You know, where you sit, you get quiet. There's there's no there's no more losing that you could do. There's only so much losing you could do. There's only so much so long your feet can be on the bottom before you go back up. So, um, you've been at that point. You you know, and thank God for the bottom to the certain certain extent. You know, because it really again allows you to sort through the noise. You know, sort through the confusion. Sort through, you know, the lies even that people are trying to get you to think about yourself or trying to think you you are you know you're lacking or you're not you're full you know and if you just can get that focus on yourself and go for it but you can look at you can look at Nole and see he's on, on some lesser level he's going through a lot of what you went through you know and I think that the media does that once you lose one you know for him he's winning all his stuff 43 43 straight matches one year 
um, number one for two years in a row in the world. I think maybe even two and a half years beating Rafa left and right, you know, and then and then really. To be quite honest, not having much competition for you because you were going through your own thing back then. You know, he didn't have as much as a tough time as a formidable opponent against you as he could have because you were busy going through your own mental thing. But in any case, um, you know, now he, you know, Rafa comes back and, is, you know, and it only takes sometimes to do one or two things and, and win a couple of matches and you know, send a player out of source, like, what happened, you know, and you could kind of see it, I'm not a player, but you could kind of see, like, people go home, and they're kind of like, well, what happened, I mean, do I have it anymore, do I, this and that, and that's what it's looking like, like, poor Nole, I really feel sorry for him, you know, I hope he gets himself, pulls himself up and really gets a grip and sees, um, really starts standing in reality of who he is as a good player, you know, because he's, he's just mentally shot. Having said all of that, again, you should not have lost that match at Indian Wells. And having said all of that, again, even though Lay at his toughest, you should be beating. Um, you know, it would be tough to beat him, but you should you should still, you know, if you're at the top of your game, you should be able to beat him. But anyway, I know I went off this really long tangent, as usual. Um... I want to get back to what this one fan said about Nole as well. You know, he said, I respect Novak in his game, but he didn't do anything. He was returning the balls basically the whole match. I mean, that's what he he's trying to say. He's, all he was doing was returning the balls. Was what I was saying to you before was he was playing point by point. You know, um, Roger was in charge, putting it... Oh, I can't really read that. I can't really translate that into proper English, but I'm just going to read the way he wrote it. Roger was in charge on putting it the net when he had the chance. Um, we watched the same match. This is what he's telling. This is what he's telling somebody who wrote to him. Did we watch the same match? Or are you blind to see that it was the other way around? I know that it's tough for a Novak fan to recognize it. I bet you wouldn't have had the same opinion if Roger won the whole match. Um, that's a little bit taken out of context. I'm not going to explain the rest of the conversation because I don't want to bore you more than I might have possibly already have. But you're at the point now where you're doing all of this work. You've made the decision on one level of your consciousness, on the main level, let's just say. Consciousness sounds like an airy-fairy word, but, you know, you really want to be the best. You really want to do all this stuff. But then you, when you get to the top, it's like unexplained, unforced errors, losing matches that you shouldn't have to lose. And so you really have to get clear on that. And I think the best way, again, to get clear on it is to not be the player on the tennis world's terms, but just be the player in your own lane, on your own terms, which is what you have been trying to do. So just do your best in any every moment possible. Get past anything, any kind of holes in the boat. And right now, the mental thing for you, that's a big, fat freaking stinking hole in your boat okay sorry um you know I, I know she said something very interesting too is which is very similar to something that I say which is you know you this is your book you can write it you know you want to rewrite your history then you know now is a time like honestly you do not have time for this mental craziness you know what I mean like you don't have time for this stuff you don't have time to be losing matches that you should be winning at Indian Wells at anywhere you know and you're getting ready to come it's just the biggest and probably I think some of your favorite part of the season which is we're getting ready to come into Wimbledon in just a little while faster than we think June will be here which is scary and if you do not get clear about being comfortable with winning. The same bullshit is going to happen in Wimbledon. You know, and you just don't need these. You don't need yourself in your own way. You need to be full throttle and doing, um, you know, having a platform to do the absolute best that you can. And when you are at your best, you beat these guys, including Rafa, including the infamous Rafa. You beat him, you know? And I mean... Look at this player, you know what I mean? I got to this crazy fan argument. Sometimes you can't even ignore some of the people who comment on, on YouTube. Sometimes you just have to come and say, I'm sorry, but you are on drugs if you think 
Rafa is the greatest of all time. <laughs> I mean, that's a forced argument, first of all. When it comes to Roger, and I probably shouldn't even be saying all this crap to you because it's probably not even what you need to hear. But when it comes to Roger, it's natural for people. It's natural for the masses in the tennis world to say, oh, greatest of all time. It's not natural for people to say Rafa is the greatest of all time. I'm not disrespecting him, but I'm just saying, like, I'm sick of the media trying to hype him up trying to do all of this stuff and i think some people use him as a way not to acknowledge you like the john McEnroe's and oh, i i do i'm sorry i went all out on john McEnroe. yes i did yes i did um you know other people just just to take take um take uh the focus off of you but you will notice you first of all get the hardest draws ever you know what i mean Rafa got some damn easy draws at Roland Garros, at least the last two years. So for me, I'm not trying to take much away from him. But for the most part, he didn't have much to do except beat Joker at Roland Garros. I'm sorry to say that sounds so messed up. But he had the easiest draws ever, at least for the last two years. So some of those eight, eight wins really, I mean, at least two were basically handed over to him. I'm not saying he had an easy time against Djokovic, but I mean... He had easy batches all the way up, which gives gives him a lot a lot less physical exertion and expense, and so makes him more available. And, and anyway, whatever, it's another conversation. But when you are at the top of your game, you win, and you just need to make a decision. You know, you're the last person standing in your own way. It's not Rafa. It's not Djokovic. It's not the media. It's not uh, Gia who makes these videos going you 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 Roger Federer. Um, it, it is it starts with Roger Federer and so you know again when you're doing your visual, visualization just visualize yourself being comfortable with winning you know and choose not to be defined by the tennis world and the media and if you're not living in those definitions then you can go out and commit to improving and being available for yourself every moment of the day every day including in your matches and winning will just simply be a byproduct of that. So having said that, I'm going to get going because I need to get my morning started. And um, I will talk to you later. Good luck. Um, really, you're looking great at Miami from what I've been able to see. And I hope to catch a few matches this week. Keep up the good work. Um, I know that you were saying in some of your matches, like with Noli and stuff, it's, it's obviously hard to come to net. But maybe push yourself too. Figure out some new ways to create ways to uh, create chances for yourself where you can come to net more with Nole. I mean, that's something that you guys, you and Stefan and Sever and he, you guys can brainstorm. I mean, you know, there's always an answer to something, even though, you know, it seems like there isn't an answer. And those, I guess when somebody is hitting a ball at you at 90 miles an hour, 70 to 90 miles an hour, of course, it's hard to run to net and take a ball early. But, you know, this is an opportunity to figure out something new and have a great breakthrough for your own game. So just keep pressing. And, and, and when you visualize, you know, say I'm willing. I'm willing to be open to the answer, you know, to, to create something, something new, something unheard of, just like you've done in the past. The shots that you've created that used to make John McEnroe go, oh, my God, I've never seen a shot like that. He just creates angles of shots I've never seen. So, you know, you can continue to create. I mean, it's your world. It's your book. Just pretend it's, it's, it's all your own story, especially if you're going to do anything with visualization. It's definitely all your own book. You know, you can, you can ask for the answer before you go to bed. You can open up and say, I'm willing to have the answer. I'm willing to see ways within my game, you know, within the match. I'm willing to be calm in my match. I'm willing to succeed in a tie break. I'm willing to make a break. I'm willing to, you know, break um, an opponent um, confidently and successfully um, and thoroughly. You know, like, just I think those are the things you need to work on. You know, um, physically you're good. Your your game strategy seems good. It seems like you're you're you know coming in net when you can looks good. Um, and just keep going, keep going from there. But it's this last mental. It's the mental thing. I mean, clearly I've been telling you for almost two years now to get a mental coach um, to help 
and um, I have suggested that a number of times. I see that you haven't really done it, and I know it's one time you mentioned that that's really not fun to do. So I'm assuming that's why you've never done it. But, um, you know, I still think it's good to have, you know, people like that because they can sort out all, they can teach you how to sort out all the noise before the match. They can teach you to sort out all the noise in the match um, and sort out all the noise even after the match. So, you know, um, you know, I always say Michael Gervais, you know, who did all the work with uh, the Red Bull, um, with the Red Bull athletes and stuff like that. Um, Pinnacle Pro or something like that. Michael Gervais and Pinnacle or whatever. I mean, even if you just have one or two clinics with him, you know, it would be great. Anyway, I'm just like talking on and on. I gotta get out of here. But have a good day. Good luck with everything. And kick ass.